Welcome to A Year of War and Peace. I'm your host, Brian E. Denton. A Year of War and Peace is a daily, year-long, chapter-by-chapter reading of and meditation on Leo Tolstoy's epic novel, War and Peace. In these videos and podcasts, you'll be treated to a free reading of one chapter per day of the novel, plus a reflective essay I've written individually tailored to that day's chapter. These readings are offered for free, though if you'd like to support me, you can do so in one of three ways. First, you could purchase my ebook, A Year of War and Peace. It features the entire novel, plus all of my reflective essays, and it's only $2.99 on Amazon.com. You could also become a patron at patreon.com slash Brian E. Denton. If you sign up there, you'll receive a sonnet once a month, plus a link to an ebook of my collected sonnets. Finally, if you like, you can make a one-time donation to my PayPal account. The email there is brianedenton at gmail.com. You can also use that email to contact me. I'd be happy to hear from you. Your support is greatly appreciated. Today's reading and reflection is on chapter 147. Chapter 147. At the end of January, old Count Rostov went to Moscow with Natasha and Sonia. The Countess was still unwell and unable to travel, but it was impossible to wait for her recovery. Prince Andrew was expected in Moscow any day, The trousseau had to be ordered, and the estate near Moscow had to be sold, besides which the opportunity of presenting his future daughter-in-law to old Prince Bolkonsky while he was in Moscow could not be missed. The Rostov's Moscow house had not been heated that winter, and, as they had come only for a short time and the Countess was not with them, the Count decided to stay with Mary Dmitrievna Akrosimova, who had been long pressing her hospitality upon them. Late one evening, the Rostov's four slaves drove into Mary Dmitrievna's courtyard in the old Kershnevia Street. Maria Dmitrievna lived alone. She had already married off her daughter, and her sons were all in the service. She held herself as erect, told everyone her opinion as candidly, loudly, and bluntly as ever, and her whole bearing seemed a reproach to others for any weakness, passion, or temptation, the possibility of which she did not admit. From early in the morning, wearing a dressing jacket, she attended to her household affairs, and then she drove out. On holy days, to church, and after the service to jails and prisons on affairs of which she never spoke to anyone. On ordinary days, after dressing, she received petitioners of various classes, of whom there was always some. And she had dinner, a substantial and appetizing meal, at which there was always three or four guests. After dinner she played a game of Boston, and at night she had the newspapers or a new book read to her while she knitted. She rarely made an exception, and went out to pay visits, and then only to the most important persons in the town. She had not yet gone to bed when the Rostovs arrived, and the pulley of the hall door squeaked from the cold air as it let in the Rostovs and their servants. Maria Dmitrievna, with her spectacles hanging down on her nose and her head flung back, stood in the doorway looking with a stern, grim face at the new arrivals. One might have thought she was angry with the travelers, and would immediately turn them out, had she not at the same time been giving careful instructions to the servants for the accommodation of the visitors and their belongings. The Count's things, bring them here, she said, pointing to the portamentous, and not greeting anyone. The young ladies, there to the left. Now what are you dawdling for? she cried to the maids. Get the samovar ready. You've grown plumper and prettier, she remarked, drawing Natasha, whose cheeks were glowing from the cold, to her by the hood. Phew, you are cold. Now take off your things, quick. She shouted to the Count, who was going to kiss her hand. You're half frozen, I'm sure. Bring some rum for tea. Bonjour, Sonia dear, she added, turning to Sonia and indicating by this French greeting her slightly contemptuous though affectionate attitude towards her. When they came in to tea, having taken off their outdoor things and tidied themselves up after having their journey, Maria Dmitrievna kissed them all in due order. I'm heartily glad you have come and are staying with me. It was high time, she said giving Natasha a significant look. The old man is here, and his son's expected any day. You'll have to make his acquaintance, but we'll speak of that later on, she added, glancing at Sonia with a look that showed she did not want to speak of it in her presence. Now listen, she said to the Count. What do you want to do tomorrow? Whom will you send for? Shenshen? She crooked one of her fingers. That sniveling Anna Mikhailovna? That's two. She's here with her son. The son is getting married. And Bazooka, eh? He is here, too, with his wife. He ran away from her, and she came galloping after him. He dined with me on Wednesday. As for them, and she pointed to the girls, tomorrow I take them first to the Iberian shrine of the Mother of God, 
and then we'll drive to the Super Rogues. I suppose you'll have everything new. Don't judge by me. Sleeves nowadays are this size. The other day, young Princess Irina Vasilevna came to see me, and she was an awful sight. Looks as if she had put two barrels on her arms. You know not a day passes without some new fashion. What have you to do yourself? She asked the Count sternly. One thing has come on top of another. Her rags to buy, and now a purchaser has turned up for the Moscow estate and for the house. If you'll be so kind, I'll fix a time and go down to the estate just for a day, and leave my lassies with you. All right, all right, they'll be safe with me, as safe as in a chancery. I'll take them where they must go, scold them a bit, and pet them a bit, said Maria Dmitrievna, touching her goddaughter and favorite, Natasha, on the cheek with her large hand. Next morning, Maria Dmitrievna took the young ladies to the Iberian shrine of the Mother of God, and to Madame Soupret Rouguet, who was so afraid of Maria Dmitrievna that she always let her have costumes, at a loss merely to get rid of her. Maria Dmitrievna ordered almost the whole trousseau. When they got home, she turned everybody out of the room except Natasha, and then called her pet to her armchair. Well, we'll now talk. I congratulate you on your betrothed. You hooked a fine fellow. I'm glad for your sake, and I've known him since he was so high. She held her hand a couple of feet from the ground. Natasha blushed happily. I like him and all his family. Now listen, you know that old Prince Nicholas much dislikes his young son's marrying. The old fellow's crotchety. Of course, Prince Andrew is not a child and can shift without him, but it's not nice to enter a family against a father's will. One wants to do it peacefully and lovingly. Now you're a clever girl, and you'll know how to manage. Be kind, use your wits, and all will be well. Natasha remained silent. From shyness, Maria Dmitrievna supposed, but really because she disliked anyone interfering in what touched of her love for Prince Andrew, which seemed to her so apart from all human affairs that no one could understand it. She loved and knew Prince Andrew. He loved her only, and was to come one of these days and take her away. She wanted nothing more. You see, I have known him a long time, and I'm also fond of Mary, your future sister-in-law. Husbands, sisters bring up blisters, but this one wouldn't hurt a fly. She has asked me to bring you two together. Tomorrow you'll go with your father to see her. Be very nice and affectionate to her. You're younger than she is. When he comes, he'll find you already know his sister and father and are well liked by them. Am I right or not? Won't that be best? Yes, it will, Natasha answered reluctantly. All right, that concludes my reading of chapter 147. I will now proceed to my reflection on the same. A Year of War and Peace, Day 147 A Ruler to Make the Crooked Straight The Rostovs arrive in Moscow. The old countess remains sick from worry over Sonia and Nicholas, so she hasn't made the trip. That leaves her husband firmly in charge of things. Clearly, then, already, the Rostov business in Moscow is off to a poor start. That guy is a disaster. Their business in Moscow is twofold. First, the old count must sell their estate near town. Secondly, Prince Andrew is expected shortly, and Natasha must make a good impression on Princess Mary and the old prince. Good luck with that, Natasha. They can't stay at their Moscow estate because the old count decided not to keep it heated during the winter. Most likely this is because he couldn't afford to keep it heated. Though, to be fair, fiscal responsibility hasn't been a guiding light so far, so we can't really know for sure. At any rate, the Rostovs accept the hospitality of Mary Dmitrievna and decide to stay with her during the visit. It's probably a good thing they decide to stay with her. Maria Dmitrievna seems like an upright noble woman. She has a nice estate and a set schedule that keeps her on the straight and narrow. She may be someone the Rostovs want to look for, for inspiration. And they need some inspiration. We know the old count is flailing. He's flailing largely due to his own incompetence and inability to act responsibly with his finances. Natasha, on the other hand, is entering adulthood and will experience increasing demands on her character. A good practice for those interested in self-improvement, such as the old count and Natasha, is to model and pattern behavior upon someone of superior virtue and moral standing. They better find that person fast. Daily Meditation There is a need, in my view, for someone as a standard against which our characters can measure themselves. Without a ruler to do it against, you won't make the crooked straight. Seneca. Letters from a Stoic. All right, so that concludes my reading and reflection on chapter 147. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks so much for listening. Remember that if you'd like to support me, you can do so either by purchasing the ebook, A Year of War and Peace, becoming a patron at patreon.com, 
or making a one-time donation to PayPal. The links to all that are down below in the show notes. Tomorrow, we're going to be reading and reflecting on chapter 148. I hope you'll join me. Until then, take care of yourselves and others.